Hey guys, so I'm hiding in my classroom <laughs> so that I can make this video. This is going to be part two of my journey in and out of Calvinism. I wanted to start the video by sharing this paragraph that was in the first chapter of this book, Whatever Happened to Justice. The boys and I are reading this for citizenship for school this year. Last year we read Whatever Happened to Penny Candy about economics. It was great. I highly recommend both of them uh, by Richard Mayberry. But um, in the first chapter, our first day reading this book, I came across this paragraph and I couldn't help but think of my current situation and to encourage you guys with what might be your current or soon to be situation. Um, it says, uh, I read a book that brought Einstein's theory of relativity down to an eighth grade level. This convinced me that any subject can be made easy. I think he's referring to a book we read last year about Einstein's theory of relativity, and I totally agree. I understood it for the first time in my life, and the boys did, so I agree. Any subject can be brought down to your level. In other words, always beware of anyone who tells you a topic is above you or better left to the experts. This person may, for some reason, be trying to shut you out. You can understand almost anything. If you know you're giving it your best effort and you're still finding an explanation difficult to grasp, it may be because the expert has poor communication skills. It could also be that the expert doesn't want you to grasp it. Many people are twice as smart as they think they are, but they've been intimidated into believing some topics are above them. I think that happens across the board with many examples, but obviously I'm referring to spiritual things here, your biblical knowledge, but we do this with, you know, I, I own my uh, freedom to educate my children myself and the way I approach medicine, I do all my research and, and take the first steps myself. And if I need the experts, I'm so glad they're there, but I'm my first resort, not them. And I think that we do, we hand everything over to them too quickly, too easily, too often because we're intimidated. We think it's above us and it isn't it isn't above us we can take ownership of many areas of our life but specifically our spiritual life we can take ownership of that we can like my husband says own our faith we need to be in the word as students of the word we have the word and i really think because we have so many teachers and such accessibility to the word and such freedom we have become lazy and I think we're gonna be held accountable to a higher standard by the Lord because we have the word and we're not in it versus the people that don't have the word, they can't be in it, but we can. We don't use what we have well. I think we're falling short of what we could be doing and also what the Lord expects of us. We have the Bible in our hands, multiple uh, translations and multiple Bibles in our homes. We need to be studying. We need to be students of the word. Um, and then he quotes Alexander Hamilton saying that people think he's a genius, but really what they see, this is Alexander Hamilton speaking, I'm not a genius. What they see is the fruit of all my hard work and all of my thinking. When I'm faced with a subject that I want to learn about, I'm just, I have it before me day and night studying it until I have a really good grasp on it. And what they see is genius, but what they don't realize it's no, it's just a lot of hard work and a lot of thinking. So I wanted to start off with that just to encourage you that we can understand almost anything. I may not be able to regurgitate it exactly the way that experts do, but I can grasp it. One of the things that I feel for me personally was kind of um, withheld on purpose. They don't want you to grasp it. One of the things that I felt like, like was being withheld from me on purpose, trying to avoid me grasping it, is compatibilism. Because it is, when you just talk to someone about it, it, you can feel like you're losing your mind. You're like, this is so crazy. We're talking past each other, past each other, past each other. And what clicked for me was when I watched the Jerry Walls, What's Wrong with Calvinism talk, which I will post in the description box below. You have got to see it. It, it. He's a philosopher. He's Arminian. So we don't fall in line with all of our beliefs. But what I found so valuable about his presentation is that because he's a philosopher, he is bringing down to my level stuff that I don't know anything about. That world is, is not my world. And so he's bringing it down to a level for his audience to understand and to grasp what is it exactly that Calvinists mean by compatibilism? What is it exactly? And he presents it, you've got to see it. I'm just going to share one little snippet about it is um, they're saying what is compatible is not 
Let me write it on the board. I'm in my classroom. I gotta use my whiteboard. Okay. I hope this makes sense because I have not practiced this yet at all. But somebody mentioned this in the comments and that's it's a good valid thing to have brought up because um, there are different kinds of free will. There's compatibilistic free will. There's libertarian free will. Though the free will that's supposedly compatible in compatibilism <sighs> with determinism is compatibilistic free will. So compatibilism, I'm just gonna abbreviate it, is saying that determinism, whatever, what they call sovereignty, okay? So every time you hear them say sovereign, what they mean is determinism, which is God has predetermined everything, good and evil, to happen the way that it does, including your thoughts, actions, and deeds since before the foundation of the world, like in eternity past, okay? For his glory. Everything is determinism. And then the free will that they're talking about is compatibilistic free will, not libertarian free will, which Jerry Walls, the philosopher that's an Arminian, calls libertarian free will real free will. The free will that any person that you come across in the street is going to think you mean when you say the words free will. So this free will just means I can either do this or not do this, okay? I can either use this black marker or not and implied everywhere in scripture because then if, if this is not reality, if you really can't choose A or B, if you really can't choose A or not A, then every single time that God presents choice before man is deceptive, right? It, it feels like, a, like wrong, unkind because God presents you with these choices, okay? And you really can go this way, this way, this way, or this way. But in compatibilistic free will, the one that's in compatibilism, you're presented with these choices, you're presented with these choices, and you could go any of them, but you wouldn't because this one has already been predetermined for you since before the foundation of the world. So they, the words, there's so many words, and really the end result is still determinism. So all the words, if you just X them out, you end up with determinism. Compatibilistic free will is simply adding a big chunk of information in between the end result, which is exactly determinism. I hope this makes sense. This, this is why I don't like going into this world, because this is not scripture. This is just... I wonder how God works and we're trying to explain how God works and really you can't. He's too above us. He is too above us. So for us to claim compatibilism is to say God is deterministic. Everything is predetermined including the decision you make. So then determinism, right? You have 50 choices but you can't make 49 of them. You can only make that one that God has predetermined. That's compatibilistic free will because you're doing it freely. You're doing it wanting to. That's why they call it free because he's not forcing you to do it. You're wanting to do it, but you can't do a different one. You can only do that one. So that's compatibilistic free will. Libertarian free will is you really do have four choices and you really could choose any of those four choices or 50 choices, and God is still the one that will guide you, lead you, help you in your life no matter which choice you take. Let's say you choose sin, you're out of his will. You are out of God's will, and you could miss out on potential blessings because you're disobeying him, but he is good and kind, and he still works all things for the good of those who love him. Not just works all things for the good, works all things for the good of those who love him. And he's in the business of redemption. That's what he does. He redeems, 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 and he still isn't finished redeeming. We can't get scared by things like, you can't thwart God's plan. Well, if this is God's plan, I mean, obviously God has an eternal plan that we can't thwart, but if this is God's plan in your life or your his desire for your life, you can't go against that? Of course you can. Every time you disobey, you're going against it. Every time the Israelites disobeyed, they were going against what God wanted for them. When Adam and Eve disobeyed, they went against what God wanted for them. Every time someone does something other than God's will, that person's going against what God wants for them. That doesn't mean that he can't redeem it. That doesn't mean, oh no, now what? 
right? That's the part that for some reason people are scared. God loves us and so he gives us true freedom. I hope that makes sense. I am not a philosopher. This is not my world. But for me, the thing that helped me understand the most about what's, what, what is it? Why is this compatible? It's because determinism, sovereignty, and compatibilistic free will means that even if you have a hundred options, the one you choose has already been predetermined by God. That's why this is different than libertarian freedom. And I don't think, and I heard this from Leighton Flowers, free will is not a superpower. Just because we have free will does not mean that God is now powerless. That's always been how he has been presented to me. Either he has predetermined all things, he has set everything in stone, or he's surprised and shocked when something happens. No, neither one. <laughs> There's not the only two options. And that's the thing I've noticed in my personal experience that I've only been presented two options, either Calvinism or Arminianism. Either God is a deterministic God that's predetermined all things, or he's a shocked, surprised God that is caught off guard all the time by man's decisions that can thwart God's will. No. Um, there are other options, and I think that if we just read the scripture, we'll see that. We don't even need to hear all the options. We can just read the scripture and get a totally different picture from both of those things. So I hope that made sense. Um, if it didn't, hopefully Jerry Walls will help you understand it a little better in his video. But I do want compatibilism or determinism or the sovereignty of God. The fact that God has predetermined every single little thing, including every event, all your actions, all your thoughts, all your deeds, all your feelings, all the ways you would react to any given event since before the foundation of the world. Keep that in the backdrop of your mind as you search the scriptures to see if Calvinism is biblical or not. Because I have a feeling if you keep that on the forefront of your mind all the time as you read the scriptures, you're going to quickly have it unravel. It's going to unravel. Even with that aside, just tackling the five points of tulip, I, um, for me personally, it definitely was not too long before I realized I had been claiming this and this passage supported total depravity or unconditional election when in fact I was reading it out of context and it wasn't saying what I was saying it was saying. Sure, it may have said man is a sinner. Sure, it may have said man is dead in their sins. That is not the same as man is incapable of seeking God. That is not the same as man is absolutely unable to respond to the good news of the gospel, which is the power of God to save anyone who believes. It's not the same. And once I realized that, my eyes started to become open more and more. Um, I can't go through every passage, of course, but I will post them all in the description box. I've got my Bible, which by the way, one of the first things I did that I didn't share in my story when I came out of Calvinism was Hector and I went to the Bible bookstore and we bought ourselves a big letter, NASB, no commentary with references. Uh, Bible each of us did so that we could read and study with no commentary just us and the Lord um, another passage before we get started that it was very powerful to me in my journey through all of this was in 1st Corinthians <sighs> chapter 1 Actually, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when I was talking about um, God has revealed, let's see, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So we have the Holy Spirit, which knows the mind of God, which dwells inside of us and teaches us, okay? This was monumental for me because I felt so inadequate when I first came out of Calvinism. I had been following man for so long. I didn't know 
how to go about studying and learning about who God is and what his word says without guidance. But I quickly realized that was a stumbling block that was unnecessarily there. I have the Holy Spirit. And then it says, we, he, us, he who is spiritual, um, appraises all things yet he himself has a, is appraised by no one for who has known the mind of the lord that he will instruct him but we have the mind of christ so the holy spirit teaches us and guides us and instructs us and he will show us if we are truly seeking and we are open and humble to the truth of the lord we bow down to the authority of the scriptures the lord's going to teach us he's going to teach us if we come thinking we have it all figured out, we know what's right, we're looking for what we're looking for to, to um, support what we know is true, then we're going to be blinded by that. We're only going to see what we want to see. And for the longest time, uh, I, I did only see certain things in scripture, like even this scripture, um, verse 14, what I just read, but a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. I would have used that to support total depravity before, but now in context, I realize it's just contrasting. Once you have the Holy Spirit and you're a believer, you can understand the things of God because you have the Holy Spirit who knows the mind of God and he is teaching you and guiding you. Before you're a believer, you don't. You don't understand that. It's foolishness. But once you are, you do. And that can be available to anybody. Um, that was really good. I also was very, you know, just reading 1 Corinthians when it starts to talk about the, the carnal, the fleshly um, manifestation of following man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, you know, there's quarrels among you. Um, each of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? All those things. Uh, also, when it talks about um, Paul in the same chapter, he says, oh no, in the first few verses of chapter two, when I came to you, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. These verses were also, for me, I felt like we were following Calvin, we were following Augustine, we were following man, right? John MacArthur and all these amazing men, but we're following them. The first thing I did, and this is what reveals it to me, the first thing I would do uh, to look up support for what I was trying to tell my friend who originally challenged me about Calvinism was look up, I would run online and see what John MacArthur said about it. I would run online and see what John Piper said about it instead of run to the scriptures and see what the, God says about it. So are you relying on man? I think your actions will reveal that to you. You might be saying, no, I don't rely on man. No, I only rely on the Bible. Where if the first, if the first place you turn is Grace to You Ministries or Desiring God to get your answers for a question, then no, you're not relying on the Bible. You're relying on man because that's their ministry and they're gonna tell you what to think of the scriptures and of the topic that you're searching. You have got to rely on the scriptures first and foremost once you've studied and you see for yourself what you think then if you want to go see what other men have said to compare your findings and see if you know you're way off or if you're right on or if you're agreeing with them or not then that's fine but bible first that will determine whether or not you are relying on man or not the fact that i was sending pictures of systematic theology books to my friend and uh, videos from John Piper and Bodhi Bakum and this guy and that guy proved that I was relying on man, not in scripture. So for me personally, the scriptures that I would have run to to prove total depravity would have been Romans 1, which I touched on quite a bit in my first video, which if I didn't tell you yet, please go watch the first video before you watch this one. It'll make more sense. Um, just in chapter one, when it talks about uh, that they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. And it just keeps going. God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored. And where's the list? There was a list that I would always go to. 
verse 29, being filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant. I used to go to Romans 1 to say, this is how man is born. And I realized when I revisited Romans 1 with the eyes of checking to see, does this support total depravity? That it was saying that when these men, these people who knew God didn't honor him by choice, right? They, instead of submitting to the truth, seeking God, they suppressed the truth. And so they became futile in their thinking. Their hearts became darkened and hardened. That's what happened as a result of suppressing the truth, which God made manifest to them in all of creation since the beginning of time. There's no excuse. So that was pretty big for me to realize it wasn't saying what I thought it was saying. It was not saying this is how man is, this is the condition of man. Um, and then in chapter two, it was also very big for me when it said, or do you, in verse four, or do you not, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Just the character of God being revealed there that it's the loving kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Don't think so lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience. Those are the things that leads people to God. And I feel like for me personally, I did think lightly of those riches of his kindness because I thought, you know, there's elect and there's non-elect and the non-elect they're doomed. And that's pretty much it, you know? And with that kind of philosophy and mentality in your heart, it starts to creep into your life in ways that you don't anticipate. You view people a little differently. Something happens, something changes, or at least it did for me, how I view people once I realized every single human I come across in the street is made in God's image. And I don't think that a Calvinist would deny that. Of course they wouldn't. But what does that mean? What does that mean to a Calvinist that man is made in God's image? It didn't mean that much to me when I was a Calvinist, to be quite honest. Now it means significantly more. I think that shows the value of a person and the beautiful, amazing design. God is creative. Humans are creative. God is discerning and wise, and he has the ability to reason and have logical thought processes. So do humans. And so non-believers create beautiful things. Have you looked at art from the Renaissance era? The lyrics of music written by non-believers. Have you listened to compositions by non-believers beautiful incredible profound poetry there is so much that a human being is capable of creating because god made them with that beautiful ability and skill because it's a little glimpse of who he is and of course how much better if those non-believers were to use those things to glorify god but just the fact that they're able to do those things even as non-believers should make us think a little like I thought they were like totally, utterly grotesque worms of people that are utterly depraved and there's like nothing good in them. And I know like in the description of total depravity, it always says, it doesn't mean that a person can will be as bad as they could be. I get it, that's the safety net. But even besides that, like when you hear, when you, every time you read wicked in, in Psalms and you interpret it as non-believers, I mean, the way that the wicked are described and that's what you think of non-believers, it's only a matter of time before that starts to creep into your heart and really manifest how you view non-believers. But think about yourself before you were a believer. And I was a sinner, yes, but I had a conscience and I listened to my conscience and I cared about doing the right thing because I have the moral co code of God put by him on my heart. Romans 2, right? It talks about that, that even the the... The Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively, instinctively, by instinct, the things of the law, okay? And this shows that the law is written on their hearts and they have a conscience. So that's how God made people. So that was monumental for me as well. I think another passage, oh, and one more thing. I have had a friend recently, I guess she loves this show called This Is Us, I've never seen it, but a lot of Christians watch that show and they love it. And I know exactly what she meant because she's still a Calvinist. She was like, I just don't understand how this show, they're non-believers, but there's so much good stuff in it. 
and I know the battle she's feeling. If man is totally and utterly and just scum of the earth depraved, then how can they make these wonderful things? Well, obviously they're making these wonderful things. You're seeing them and hearing them with your own eyes and ears. You're feeling them with your own heart, right? So maybe this one's wrong. <laughs> maybe they're not the scum of the earth, totally and utterly depraved to a point where they can't do anything good. Sure they can. And you're watching it and you're feeling it. You're seeing it. You are experiencing the thing they made that beautiful show, which I've never seen. So I'm just saying off of her, um, uh, description of it, but I have been brought to tears by many a song by non-believers, many stories, many movies, many poems, many, because human beings are profound, incredible creations made by God himself in his image. And he made us for good things. But, you know, like it says in Ecclesiastes, God made man upright, but they devised all sorts of evil schemes in their hearts and they go the wrong way. Why? We're in this flesh. Do a study on the flesh. In the flesh is where passion and lust and desire is bound up. We're gonna sin. We're gonna sin because the flesh is weak and we're in this world. We're not on our own. We are being attacked left and right, not just with the weakness of our flesh, but also the enemy and the world all the time. And so we give in because we are weak. Even when our spirit is willing, we're desiring to honor and obey God, our flesh falls. We give in. We react. I mean, it's not like I think I'm going to lose my temper today. No, I react in my flesh and I lose my temper and I act a fool and sin and hurt people. And guess what? All those things have an effect on the people around me. Not because God predetermined it, but because I lost my temper. I behaved wrongly and sinfully, and it truly does affect the people around me. So the lie of you can't ruin your kids. Don't believe that nonsense. It's not a free ticket to just do whatever you feel like it, raising your children. It is not a free ticket to not be super intentional with how you teach your kids. Yes, you can ruin your kids. Yes, you can fail your kids. Yes, you can lead them in the wrong direction, be a terrible example. Yes, you can. And I think that one of the most appealing things to human beings about compatibilism or determinism or whatever you want to call it and total depravity is that we don't want to be responsible. It is a beautiful opportunity to say, oh, everything's gonna just happen the way it's supposed to happen anyway, so I don't have to worry. I can just be free in Christ and not work so hard and worry so much and try so hard. Okay, I get to chill. That is appealing to some people. And that I think is, without being so blunt, fluffed up with a lot of words, putting it like in a different light where you are so terrible, you can never do good, there's nothing good in you, thank goodness it's all in God's hands, you can't persuade someone to know the Lord, there's no reason for you to urge them or beg them or plead with them, God has to do a work in their heart, you just, you just say the words, be obedient and God will do the rest, all that sounds fine and dandy, find me some support for that in the scriptures, first of all, second of all, man, what a sweet deal. I have seen people end up not going to the mission field after becoming Calvinists. I have heard people tell me straight out the reason they ended up not going overseas was because of their theology. I know people personally that thought, that have told me, what is the point of prayer? I don't pray as much as I used to because of Calvinism, okay? I know and see with my own eyes and I have experienced myself that evangelism slows down dramatically after becoming a Calvinist. A Calvinist. It is not across the board what everybody goes through. All of us are individuals. We're all going to internalize all this information differently and it's going to manifest in our lives differently. Some people are arrogant and proud and argumentative. Um, look at those Hillsboro uh, Calvinist uh, church in California, they go out there with signs, calling people all sorts of hideous names. They're very much against the homosexual. And so they're just saying all these mean things about burning in hell and all this stuff. Part of me wonders, like, why are you doing that? Like God predetermined that they would be who they are. So why do they need you in their face with signs? Like what pleasure are you getting out of that? Obviously your goal is not to save them. Obviously your goal is not to help them see the error of their ways so that they can come to Christ. There is no love in what you're doing. It is 100% hate. 
So what, what is the motive behind what they're doing? I don't even get it. I don't get what their reasoning is. No one is going to read that sign and say, that's right. I need Jesus. No one is going to respond that way. But even if, even if like what they're saying is true, which I think it's evil and hateful, um, who are they yelling at? The people that God has predetermined would be that way. They have no choice. I mean, you make no sense, you know, like that, that doesn't even make sense to me. So you see it manifest in that way with these people holding these billboards of hateful things towards a group that pretty much is doomed because they can't come out of that. That's what God predetermined for them to live and be. And then you have other people that are petrified, wondering all the time whether they're elect or not. I didn't go through that, but I know people personally that fear whether they're elect or not. And they have this constant turmoil of wondering, am I really Christian or not? Because honestly, when you change the Bible, where it says all and world, and that Jesus died for the whole world, and Jesus died for every man, every man, tasted death for all mankind, um, paid a ransom for all. When you change all those words to not mean world and all, then where are you in the scriptures? Where are you able to look at the Bible and say, hey, look, I'm part of the world. I'm part of mankind. I'm part of all. I'm part of everyone. And Jesus died for those people. So that means he died for me too. That means he died for me also. You're left with no, nothing. You're left with no security because you don't believe world means world and you don't believe all means all and you don't believe mankind means mankind. So how do you know that Jesus died for you personally? You, the person listening to my voice right now, how do you know Jesus died for you? What scripture do you go to for that? There is none because a Calvinist has redefined all those words. And so now what you're left with is your life. You either prove it through your life or you're not really a Christian because Calvinists will also say if you um if you're elect you will have fruit and you will persevere to the end and if you don't then you're not a Christian okay so then you're banking on your your performance I do believe in living out a holy life I do believe in that I do believe that if you're a transformed new creation of the living God with the Holy Spirit and dwelling within you, that your life should change. There should be some evidence of that in your life. I do believe that, but I do not hold that to be the proof and the evidence that I am the Lord's. I know that he died for me because I believe world means world and all means all and mankind means mankind and everyone means everyone and I'm one of those people. So I can rest there. My assurance comes from that. And now I believe him when he says, if I believe, I am saved and I do he who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved he who believes in his heart will be saved he who calls on the name of the Lord will not be put to shame that's it I believe so I'm saved now what I'm his disciple and I must walk in the way he's instructed me to walk and he has given me the Holy Spirit the helper to guide me and help me along the way um back to the topic another verse or section I think people go to all the time for um total depravity is in Romans 3, that long section starting in verse 11 all the way to 18. There's none righteous, not even one. No one has understanding. No one who seeks God. All have turned aside. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat's an open grave. All of that. Now, Paul is quoting from several Psalms and a proverb here. This was huge for me too. When I started to read the scriptures again, revisiting Calvinism, I started to do all the cross references every time that something was quoted from the Old Testament to read that in context so that I could figure out why he was bringing it up here, okay? So the context of the whole chapter three is talking about how everyone needs a savior. Everyone does because you cannot, through your righteousness, make it on your own, okay? So he starts to quote, bam, bam, bam one verse from Psalm something, another verse from Psalm something, another verse from Psalm something. There's like six or seven Psalms represented here and a proverb, okay? Now, if you go and read each one of those Psalms in their entirety, you will see that this verse is talking about the wicked in that Psalm, but there's also the always the contrast of the righteous. Who is the righteous, right? Who's the wicked? Read the Psalms, all seven of them, okay? Read the Proverbs. And then also take into consideration genre. Psalms are 
poetry, music, songs, right? And prayers by David. There are definitely some prophetic things in there, but it's not all theology. It's a different genre of scripture. And you have to consider that when you're reading the Psalms. There's a lot of very passionate, expressive verbiage in the Psalms. And he says things from, you know, everyone has turned aside and no one seeks God all the way to no harm can come to me because I'm yours, Lord. Well, obviously there is harm that can come to Christians. I am the Lord's, but yes, harm can come to me. I'm not guaranteed safety, but have I felt that way before? Like what David says, because I'm yours, Lord, I am safe. No one can touch me. No one can harm me. Yep. I have definitely felt that way before, but that's an emotion, a deep emotion of feeling safe and secure in the refuge and the arms of Jesus. That is what he was feeling when he wrote that. It's a beautiful thing to read the heart of David and know I have felt that way, or I'm allowed to feel that way, or I'm allowed to cry out to God this way when I'm in despair or whatever, but it is not theology. And we can't take every genre of scripture as theology. So that was something else to consider. I'm not saying that therefore man is righteous, but I think it's saying not righteous in their, of their, of their selves to be able to save themselves. Of course, man can do good things when they're not Christians and of course, we can't save ourselves. That's why Jesus came and he imputes his righteousness to us, which is what the next chapter goes to talk about, or really the second half of chapter three and all of chapter four in Romans. We need Jesus' righteousness and Abraham's our example. Abraham trusted God before he was also no one seeks God. Okay, well, again, read the whole Psalm, but also what about Jesus telling us to seek him, right? He who seeks, he who asks, he who knocks. Where's he saying that? He's saying that on the Sermon on the Mount, talking to a bunch of non-believers from all over the place, right? So why is he saying that? Because it's possible. Why does he say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, right? What's that mean? Who are humble. Why does he say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? How can they hunger and thirst for righteousness if they're not, you know, Christians, if they're depraved, non-regenerate, unsaved people? because they can, <laughs> because they can. And he talks about he who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, can they humble themselves? I think so, yeah, I think so, because it's implied over and over. Ephesians 2, this one's also used a lot, but it's again, just not in context. Um, we're dead in our trespasses, yep. Um, verse three, among them, you, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. We lived dead in our trespasses. We lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature, we were naturally children of wrath, even as the rest children of wrath. I always used to think that meant God, God's wrath was on us. No, when you, when you look up the the original language is talking about we were naturally children of instinct. Our instinct was to do what the flesh tells us to do, of impulse, children of impulse. Because look at the next verse. It's not talking about God yet. It's talking about us in verses one through three. Okay, we are children of, of impulse, of anger, of we were naturally, instinctively children of anger, children of impulse. I think those were the two words that wrath uh, were translate, was translated to. And then starting in verse four, now it's talking about God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So it's talking about us, then God in response to us. His response to us isn't wrath, that's still talking about the humans. Naturally, we're children of instinct. Naturally, we're children of wrath and indulgence, right? Because of the flesh and the desires and the passions in the flesh. But separate, God was so merciful that even when we were in that state, he came to save us. That's God. That's the picture of who God is. And that's monumentally different for me because for me, I, I was taught God is this angry, enraged God that wants to destroy and devour sin. And yes, sin will be judged. And yes, there will be judgment. And yes, God hates sin. But that's not here just yet. Right now, 
he wants to save the world. <laughs> he wants to save. He wants everyone and anyone to come to him. He does not de he does not delight in the destruction of the wicked, but instead he prefers that people will come to Christ. His desire is that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus. Okay, I was watching my video and editing and I wanted to add a passage um, regarding God's wrath uh, in Romans chapter two. It says, just starting from verse one, uh, therefore you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment for in that which you judge one another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Okay, so God is just. He judges us according to our deeds. He judges us according to whether we suppress the truth or not, right? Romans 1, he is just, and I believe that with all my heart. I brought up this passage because of the wrath part. I had just talked about the wrath not being God, who's being referred to as wrathful in Ephesians 2. But of course God is wrathful. Of course there's judgment. I just think it's reserved for the day of wrath when he will judge each one of us according to our deeds. Um, and... It's saying here that you're storing up wrath for yourself because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself. So if there's election, election for salvation before the foundation of the world, some are guaranteed going to hear the gospel and believe it because they are elect. Everyone else is guaranteed lost, no hope for them whatsoever, no matter how many times they hear the gospel. Who is having that wrath stored up for them? Only the non-elect, but they're hopeless already. So is it just for God to store up wrath for the hopeless? Isn't it better for those not elect people to never hear the gospel? Because the more they're aware and made aware of the truth and continue to reject it and be stubborn, it's just more wrath for them? All for God's glory? Is that really what this text is saying? That if you're not elect and you hear the gospel and you're stubborn and you reject it, then you're storing up more wrath for yourself for the day of judgment? I mean, seriously, is that what this is saying? Or is this implying you have the full capacity to reject and be stubborn and not be repentant and therefore you are going to be judged according to that, which you freely did according to your deeds. I mean, I don't see how we could read that and come away with anything other than just the clear, the simple reading of the passage. I saw this clip. Um, in fact, I'll show it. Uh, I'll, I'll show the link in the description box. It was a Leighton Flowers com compilation, is that what it's called? Of Calvinists witnessing. And they found themselves in a hard place because some of the people they were witnessing to uh, asked these questions. Like the guy, I think he was a Mormon. He was saying, so if I'm not elect, basically you sharing the gospel with me is not good because I'm just storing up more wrath for myself and I can't even believe anyway. And I think it was, what's his name, sharing the gospel in that clip, James White. And you could see that he was like, Ugh. because what do you say to that? Yeah, yeah, you're not elect. You're never gonna believe because God didn't choose you. And every time you hear the truth, you're gonna reject it because God didn't choose you. And that's gonna make him have more wrath poured on you on the day of judgment. Like, you guys. <laughs> let's come let us reason together as the lord says come let us reason together because you are able to reason you have been given tools by god himself your mind your heart your conscience your ability to, to discern and reason use them okay use them you tell me if that is what you see in the scriptures for you to say that um god's will is always accomplished then he would have to be lying when he says that what he wants is that everyone would come to him, right? What he wants is that, but he really does leave it up to you. He's made himself known to us through creation, through the prophets, through the apostles, through the Bible, 
Jesus coming in the flesh through now Christians spreading the good news. He's made himself known to us and he works in other ways in addition to that. He leaves it up to you. His desire is that you will respond positively and come to him. And I don't think he would offer it if you couldn't. That would be a very disingenuine offer. Here, here's this thing. I know you can't receive it, but here, here's this thing. I know you're incapable of saying yes, and only I can make you say yes, and I'm not going to make you say yes, but here's this thing. Is that the God you see? Is that what you see? I don't. I see a genuine God that truly loves, that truly desires that we would all come to him, that has made every possible provision for us to do that, and we can receive it or not. Let's go to this one last verse, Romans. 8 7 and 8 okay so this is deliverance from bondage which is talking about the law of sin and death our flesh our spirit walking in with the spirit right for those starting in verse 5 for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who are according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind is set on the flesh, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So they use that verse to say, we're unable to please God. Um, we're not even able to do so, right? It's talking about we're not even able in this flesh to fulfill the law. We're not even able in this flesh to fulfill the law and therefore please God. That's why further up, Jesus came, right? It says, Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. We're so weak in our flesh, we couldn't do it. God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of, of this sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So what we were not able to do in the flesh, how we could not please God in the flesh by fulfilling the law perfectly because our flesh is weak, God did it. He sent his son in the same flesh offered for our sin. He condemned sin in his perfect flesh. He was able to do it and he was able to please God in our place. So that's the context. Does that mean that a human being is unable to seek God? No. And then Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I mean, the gospel is powerful, right? Doesn't it say somewhere that the word of God does not come back void? Well, guess what? The gospel comes back void every time you preach it to a non-elect person. It has no power of salvation at all for that non-elect person. It is just Charlie Brown's mom. Bah, 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 bah. There is no power, nothing in the gospel for a non-elect person, nothing. There is no hope. There is no one worse off on the face of the planet than a non-elect person in Calvinism. Okay, no matter how many times you share the gospel with them, no matter how much you pray for them, sorry, there's nothing that can change the fact that they're not elect. If you have a non-elect child or two or three or four, you may love your child more than God does. According to one of my friends who was honest enough with me to say, yeah, the parent that has a non-elect child loves that child more than God loves that child. Thanks for your honesty, dude. I appreciate it lay it out real so we can all see the real picture so we can all say whether we agree with it or not in a clear way when it's all fluffed up with the beautiful words it's hard to see straight sometimes but when you have it just laid out for you plain and simple black and white it's a lot easier to compare to scripture and a lot easier to determine whether it's true or not um somebody else that was very honest with me which i so appreciate they said we feel free but we're really not so life's just a big old lie. You're not doing anything that matters. You're just playing the part of what's been predetermined for you. It's a big script. God is the main actor. He follows his lines. You follow your lines. You express the feelings and the reactions that you've been predetermined to feel and have. And everything's just a big script, everything. You can just pretty much sit back, relax, and 
enjoy your purposeless life. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Thankfully, some people are honest enough to say that, but there's also people that are honest enough to say, even though I am a determinist, I know I can't live like that every day. I mean, seriously, try to live for 30 minutes like you believe, like you like what you say you believe. I am a compatibilist, I'm gonna live it out for 30 minutes. Okay, let's see, let's see. Every time your child disobeys, you have no right to get frustrated. Every time something, someone offends you, hurts your feeling, does something wrong towards you, you better not get frustrated. God predetermined that they would do that. So glorify God because that's bringing him glory somehow. Don't get upset at politics. Don't get upset at the abortion number. Don't get upset at inflation and the way this country is going downhill. This is the way God wants it, right? It's all happening for his glory. It's all predetermined, set in stone. This is God's plan A. Human beings and their terrible decisions have nothing to do with this and the way that this has turned out. Sorry guys, that sounds like the sweetest cop out in the world, but I'm not gonna take it because I actually do think my life matters and I can make a difference in this world and I can shape these young men to be godly men that change the next generation and impact their families and their children and their grandchildren. And I think that's the way God's designed it to be since the beginning of time. That's why he tells us to teach the children, <laughs> teach them my ways. When they get up in the morning, as, they, as you walk by the way, as they lay down to sleep, teach them my ways. Why? Why would he say that? Why would the Proverbs be filled with such wisdom when none of that wisdom really, you know, applies? Don't be a fool. Well, I will be if God predetermines for me to be. Don't you need to be wise? Well, I will be if God predetermines me to be. Trust the Lord through your suffering. Well, I will if God predetermines me to. Uh, persevere, grow in your faith through your trials. Well, I will if God predetermines me to. Don't get mad at God through your trials. Don't turn your back on God. Well, I won't unless God predetermines that I do. I mean, everything that happens, try to put that logic behind it. Okay, and then you tell me if it holds water. Let's read some scripture. My favorite one to go to because it's right at the beginning of the Bible where God's establishing who he is with us. And I mean, seriously, Adam and Eve, he tells them what to do. I was gonna go to Cain and Abel, but um, I'll just talk about Cain and Abel. He tells, he, I'll talk about Adam and Eve. He tells them, don't eat of the fruit, okay? If he predetermined that they were gonna disobey him, then why would he say, don't eat of the fruit, okay? If they listened to the serpent, but he, he predetermined for them to listen to the serpent, then why is he judging the serpent? Why is he judging uh, Adam and Eve? Why is he cursing the ground? Why is he cursing the serpent? Everything's just happening the way he planned it to happen, so what is the judgment for? Um, Cain and Abel, when Cain, uh, kills his brother and the Lord says to him, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will, you, will not your countenance be lifted up? Hey Cain, if you do the right thing, won't your countenance be lifted up? But I've predetermined that you're actually not gonna do the right thing, you're actually gonna murder your brother and then I'm gonna punish you. But I'm gonna ask you this question genuinely. Hey, why don't you do well? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I'm telling you that sin's crouching at your door and I'm telling you to master it, but I have predetermined that you're not going to master it and you're actually gonna murder your brother. I don't think that's the Lord that we serve and follow. So the Lord is not a liar. He's not a trickster. He doesn't mean this, but say this. He says what he means, you guys. And if you approach scripture like this, you will realize there's a lot that we're adding that is philosophical and not not true, not God. Um, in Samuel, somewhere in first or second Samuel, there's a story about David. I'm sure you heard it, where David asks God, if I go to this place, is Saul gonna overcome me? And God tells him, yes. God knew that outcome if he went that way, but David didn't go that way. Instead, he went somewhere else. And then Saul didn't overcome him. God knew both outcomes because God knows everything. And so the same way, I think God knows all possibilities and all results to all possibilities. And somehow, sometimes he lays out for us just to obey me or not. If you obey me, this is gonna happen. If you don't, this is gonna happen. He lays it out 
and it really really is up to the person in jeremiah 18 he's revealing his character to us he says if at one moment i speak to a nation or a kingdom to uproot it or pull it down or to destroy it if that nation which i have spoken against turns from its evil i will relent concerning the calamity i planned to bring on it okay so is that true does god mean that i hope so he's saying it i don't see how we can take anything other than that when we read it i would hope we're not taking anything other than that when we read it if you want to put compatibilism in there then you would have to say if at one moment I predetermined to say these bad things about this nation and then I'm gonna predetermine that they turn from their evil ways so that then I can say okay now I'll bless you like seriously is he following a script or is he truly free and we're truly free and he's truly giving us freedom and telling us what he wants and letting us decide um, or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build it up or to plant it but if it does evil in my sight by not obey, obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good things which I had promised to bless it. it. Sounds like it's in the nation's hands on whether they're gonna obey or not. Deuteronomy 30 has another great story um, where he says, I'm, I hold before you life and death. And I think it's true. <laughs> he really does choose life. He says, this isn't beyond you. This is not too far for you to understand or grasp. Um, Deuteronomy 30, starting in verse 11 it's not too difficult for you it's not out of reach and then he tells him down here in verse 15 i command you love the lord your god walk in his ways keep his command his, his commandments and there'll be blessings right but if your heart turns away and you do not obey but you're drawn away to worship other gods then i will you shall surely perish so is god going to determine whether they love him and obey him or not I hope not. Like, why would he present this offer? I, I hold before you today life and death, blessing and curse. So choose life. Choose life. Does he mean it? I have no reason to believe he doesn't. By loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, by holding fast to him, for this is your life and the length of your days. And it goes on. That's the God of the Bible good honest genuine means what he says says what he means we can learn so much from his good character and there's more uh jonah he tells jonah i'm gonna destroy nineveh in 40 days did he mean it or was he just saying that then he goes and they repent so he doesn't destroy them hezekiah he tells isaiah right go tell hezekiah he's gonna die hezekiah goes inside and prays and then God says, go back in there and tell him I heard his prayer and I'm giving him an extra 15 years. So was it true that he was gonna die or not? I think it was true and that his prayer has power because prayer has power. We are allowed to talk with God, interact with God, dialogue with God, wrestle with God, go back and forth with God. He moves, his, his mighty hand moves. There is power in prayer. He hears our hearts, supplications, and he answers them. Moses, there's many stories of Moses praying for Israel, Moses and Aaron falling on their face for Israel, and God answering their prayers. More than four times it happens if you read through Numbers. You either need to claim that the scriptures don't mean what they plainly say, that there's actually a secret hidden meaning that somehow you know, or that that little secret hidden Gnostic meaning that people are claiming that they know what God actually means when he says these things is just man-made nonsense and the scriptures actually mean what they plainly say. Um, and that's what I'm going to go by. Uh, there's also one verse, last thing I'll say, and I know there's so much more, but I hope that what I've shared today has at least started your journey, started some thoughts, has been slightly thought provoking. I'm not trying to give a perfect summation of all the scriptures that prove that humans can see God. Um, but just some verses. Um, there's one, I'll just tell you what it says somewhere. I can't remember where. It says that God searches the hearts of man and reveals himself to those who are seeking him. Okay, so man can seek God. 
man can respond to God positively. All the things God has shown us, we can respond to it. And then Jesus, when he talks about the parables, why he speaks in parables, because he says in Matthew 13, verse 15, that these people, they have closed their eyes okay they have closed their ears if they didn't do that they would be able to see and hear and understand with their heart and they would return and i would heal them so you can hear and understand with your heart and return and be healed by god you can you can humble yourself you can respond to god there's also a scripture that talks about um the is the jews being stiff-necked people and unwilling right when jesus is lamenting over jerusalem he says jerusalem jerusalem how often i wanted you but you were unwilling they were unwilling and then in acts it talks about you you always resist the holy spirit he's talking to the jews there they're resisting the holy spirit they're not responding they don't want they're suppressing right so their hearts grow callous and hardened there's so much of course i can go on um but i want you to not just listen to me this is just a little bit of the stuff that i thought about read about dove into scripture saw for myself have to weigh out first of all i hope you saw that the scriptures that i used to say supported the inability of a human being to respond positively positively to god or to seek god how the ones i used to support that where I was looking at them out of context, first of all. And then in addition to those, scripture that goes contrary to the thought that man cannot respond to God, man cannot seek God, man is unable. And then of course, philosophical arguments. There has gotta be philosophical argument. And we have experiences in life and you know plenty of people that are not murderers and thieves that are just like, do their job, go to work every day, come home, they have a garden. And sure, they're not Christians, but are they like, psycho evil murderers no they're just humans that need jesus and sure they're sinful but they're not the wicked that the psalmist talks about god destroy them why why would we be like destroy our neighbor that doesn't love jesus how about destroy the taliban <laughs> you know those are the wicked that i think of those that are like swift to run to shed blood that are always scheming divisive and evil wicked plans to hurt the innocent who are the innocent? The innocent are the people that are not going around devising wicked schemes to hurt others. And so you gotta think logically sometimes too and just reality, look around you. So I hope this is an at least thought provoking and helpful in some way. A lot, there's so much, it's such a deep and wide topic that it's kind of hard to narrow it down to just let's talk about this. But I feel like I focused mostly on compatibilism and total depravity and hopefully the scripture helped you see why I am where I am today. Please share comments and extra scripture in the comment section that you could add to this discussion. God bless you guys. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out the first video. See you next time.